Hello, good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Russell, and I'm with Iron USA, the International Education and Resource Network. First, I want to just give a huge thanks to Lucy and Steve, who I'm meeting for in person uh, the, for the first time after four years of participating in the Global Education Conference. So it's really an honor to be here and to meet you um, and to participate in this event. Um, we have a great panel. Um, Oh, there he is. <laughs> we have a great panel um, for this session where we're going to be focusing on planning and prioritizing at the leadership level for global competency. So of course, advocating to put uh, global competency on the agenda and um, garnering support um, and defining it um, are the first steps, but then actually implementing it and doing the work um, and supporting schools and teachers and students to be globally competent is um, another challenge. So um, we're going to hear from a variety of administrators and education leaders today about their approaches um, and some of the successes and challenges that they've had. Um, so here with us today we have uh, Dr. Brandon Wiley, who is pre president of Global Ed Leader, um, and Dr. Tony Jackson, uh, the vice president for education from Asia Society. Um, and David Young, who is with VIF International Education. He's the CEO. It's good to see you. And um, Claire Yvonne Lee, who is the executive director of the Global Oneness Project. Um, and in this panel, we're going to pick up on a couple of the threads from the first panel. Um, but I'm going to start pretty broadly um, for whoever wants to take it first um, with the first question. And it, that is, how can schools ensure that all students receive an international experience as part of their education. I'm I'm looking at David first. <laughs> All right. um, well, yeah, so listening to the, the earlier panel, um, there were a lot of, lot of great points. And, uh, and then looking at technology and the, the potential for how technology can extend global learning much more broadly is, is um, it's, it's a great opportunity for, for all of us. Um, let's just uh, take a minute to think about some of the statistics. So um, one of the things we know is uh, many of us here, uh, our, our global experiences are likely rooted in some travel, probably some study abroad. Uh, some of us probably worked in other countries um, and had those opportunities. Uh, the reality is that's pretty rare. Um, when we look at uh, the percentage of U.S. citizens that travel uh, outside of North America, it's, it's extremely low. Uh, about 30% of us have passports. Um, it, it appears, so you get a lot of different uh, numbers, but it appears that only about 15% of us leave the continent. Um, we know that uh, only about 20% of us take a foreign language um, in, in, uh, in our current public schools. Um, we know that teachers, um, as education majors, study abroad at almost the lowest rate of any major. Um, only agriculture majors study abroad at a lower rate. Um, so when you start looking at the, the, the numbers and trying to figure out a, how do we extend these kinds of opportunities to all students, um, we have our work cut out for us. And the first thing I would say is that, um, you know, there's a lot of us here, but we're really not that many. I mean, we're talking about less than 100 people here trying to, to push this work. We've got our work cut out for us, and, and working together is going to be very, very important. Um, just to give a, a thought on, on one uh, particular uh, statistic that's a, a, a little bit disheartening is, you know, everybody loves IB, and, and IB is incredible. It's wonderful. Um, but we have 140,000 schools in the United States, and, and we have 858 IB schools. I mean, so we're really talking about a 99% a issue here. How, it's a 1% versus 99% issue. How do you get to the other 99%? And based on the earlier panel, I, I think you know, one of the clear things is technology gives us the opportunity to really extend well beyond the 1%, but we've got to figure out what that looks like um, and how to make it happen. Great. Thank you, David. And I want to pass it next to uh, Dr. Tony Jackson, if you would, um, from your work building right. the Asia Society, the Global Competence Matrix, and then how are you working with schools um, then in implementation? Well, I mean, um, I think many of you may well know that Asian Society has had a network of uh, schools in the United States that have been internationally focused, the National Studies Schools Network for some time now, about 45 schools altogether. And I think one of the things that I would just add is um, if we want young people to have international experiences, both going to someplace else or um, having it virtually, it has to be a priority. It has to be built into the school design. I mean, that, that's been our, our sense of it, that, that it can't be sort of um, that which is you get to when you have time or, you know, a special opportunity. 
but if, if, if it's valued deeply, then it needs to be that part of the structure of the school that doesn't get you know, kind of washed over, which means from a structural point of view that there actually has to be somebody whose job it is to make sure that there's opportunities for kids to do that. And I know that's difficult, but I mean, again, these are difficult choices we have to make. And it also um, means that it has to become part of the culture. There's you know, certain expectations that kids will have and their parents will have that you know, the three or four or five years that, well, depending on what kind of school it is, but when my child is in the school, I can expect that they're going to have interactions with people from other cultures in a very authentic way that may involve going to someplace else. At the very least, though, it would be that they have opportunity to do that on a regular basis um, through a virtual technology. So I just think it needs to be hardwired into what we think school is about. Brandon? Yeah, I'll just add on that a little bit by saying whenever I have an opportunity to talk with superintendents or principals in particular, one question I ask them is, how do you define success for your kids? Right, when they leave your school, what does success look like? What do you hope that they'll know and be able to do and be when they leave you? And first of all, if they don't have an answer to that, we have a problem, right? <laughs> uh, second of all, if they do have an answer and it does not include the types of things we're talking about today, then that's also a problem, right? If they're talking about rankings or test scores or, or even graduation rates, which today now is the low bar in my mind, uh, now it's not about getting kids to graduate high school, it's about their attainment of a college degree and beyond, right? That they're prepared for college and career. So first of all, there has to be a commitment at the leadership level that global competence, developing students' global competence is part of the definition of what success looks like. And it starts there from a leadership perspective. And then I totally agree with everything uh, Tony said about the, the DNA of the school and having to be sort of baked into the structure. But I also think there has to be sort of a continuum of entry points for schools and districts to get started. In other words, there's no one way in particular for a school or a district to begin to try to bring global in. And so the, the continuum can include a lot of different things. It can include things like partnerships. It could include travel, but very often it, there's an equity issue involved with travel. It's not for all kids, it's for some kids, mm -hmm. right? And so on that continuum, we have to think about whether it's partnerships, travel opportunities. Uh, for me, where the rubber meets the road is where are we really bringing global into the curriculum, instruction, and assessment? Right, and a very deep level. How do we build that in of a student's experience? Uh, and then lastly, there has to be a plan, right? And so I think, and to answer your question, I think if there isn't a strategic plan where we've defined global competence and, and this ability for students to engage with the world as part of our definition of success, we haven't created the different entry points for schools to think strategically and in bite sizes, mm -hmm. then it doesn't happen. And then lastly, we need a strategic plan to kind of guide that work that's transparent that everyone can buy into. Thank you. I'm going to turn over to Cleary now um, with Global Oneness Project. If you could share some yeah. of your perspective. I would just add a little bit to what Brandon was saying. And from my perspective as a curriculum writer and taking it to the curriculum level, building in um, opportunities for teachers to build in interdisciplinary uh, learning. So I'll just share a quick um, experience just that happened last week. I just got a, an email from a teacher who's an environmental science high school teacher who's using a short film that looks at um, globalization and consumerism. Um, and they're working with a high school teacher in the same school who's studying a, a post-apocalyptic story. And so the two t classes are merging together. And I think there's a lot of different examples that we can explore on an interdisciplinary level, but that's just a start. Great, and of course, with interdisciplinary level, you're going to need the, the big support from the, the leaders at the school to make it coordinate, make that happen. And I, I wanted to um, get your perspective on working with school leaders. How do you in, encourage them to make global competency a priority um, in, in their schools? So what, any sort of success stories or challenges that you faced in working with districts or school levels to bring that in as a priority? Go ahead, I'll, I'll just I'll just start um, and be brief about it. I mean, I think building on what has been said, but Brandon particularly, I think um, to the extent that you can both make the case for why global competence unto itself is critical is part of the reason, part of the way in which you engage leaders in this work. But I think also there is a real need to make sure that it's not orthogonal to what they have to do in their daily work, and 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 so it has to be seen as not only by by school leaders, but particularly by teachers as that which is going to enhance their capacity to do what they have to do. And so we, we sort of think about there being kind of two intertwined gaps that we have to worry about, the achievement gap and the opportunity gap. The opportunity gap being that which 
has to do with, you know, whether or not you're getting the capacities to be able to be a part of the global economy, to be able to really be able to, you know, work within a global environment in terms of collaboration and so forth. Um, but if those two things don't come together, um, then you have, you know, uh, you, you have for people forced to make choices between them, and you can't, that, that's not going to work. And so to the extent you can blend these things together so that people can see doing project-based learning that brings in international perspectives, international problems, issues as a way to infuse you know, the learning of the core content within even the, you know, the common core, that to us is the way in which you, you make this you know, a palatable, um, useful thing that I want to do for my kids. And also because I need to make sure that, particularly from an equity standpoint, all kids are making the achievement gains they need to make to make sure that they get the coin of the realm kind of uh, outcomes they need to be able to go to college and so forth. So blending those two things together, making sure that you're on point in both instances, I think is, is really critical. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think global as a lens, as opposed to an additional subject, if it's the lens through which teaching and learning occurs, I think that that's a, a better approach. What we've seen in, in the schools that we're working with is that if you can integrate into all subjects, um, so a math teacher, a science teacher, a elementary ed teacher, all of these teachers can learn to integrate global concepts into their teaching. Any subject can be globalized. Um, so I think, I, I think learning uh, to, to uh, help teachers to do this work is critical and, and giving teachers the professional development and the resources to be able to, to move in this direction. I think, I think principals need to see that it, it's not just something else, right? I mean, they're overwhelmed. And so uh, if global can be part of what they're doing, as Tony says, um, I think that that's a, a better approach for all of us and we can make more, much more progress. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would just add that, um, first of all, I think being building principal is the hardest job in the ecosystem, <laughs> right? Having been a district office guy myself, I can tell you their jobs are the toughest. And I think to, to David's point, it, I'm sorry, I made it, it the toughest. Yeah, maybe that's why. <laughs> I hope not. I hope I cleared the way actually for them. But but the, the reality is um, there are so many demands on schools right now in terms of accountability and the things that we're expected to do. So the question is how, uh, to Tony's point earlier, how do we not make global education one more thing on the plate, but the plate, mm -hmm. right? So that's the lens through which we see everything that we're doing in the school. And I think the word that I use very often is intentionality. How are we intentional about the things we're doing with students on a daily basis? So when you really unpack this idea of global competence, investigate the world, way perspectives, uh, the, the d domains that were shared in the earlier panel, like what does that actually look like in the classroom? What are the, what are the teacher moves? What are the strategies? What are the activities that a teacher can use to engage students in those four areas? When you can really break it down to that level, then it starts to help people understand like this isn't something new I have to learn. I might have to do some, some nuance. I may have to be a little more intentional with what I'm doing uh, instructionally. And a lot of principals that I'm working with in coaching, uh, frankly, you know, they have this long list of things that they're responsible for every day, one of which are teacher evaluations. Right? I don't know a principal actually that isn't uh, overwhelmed right now by teacher evaluations. Mm -hmm. And so when you really unpack what are you looking for when you go into classrooms, whether it's student engagement, the questioning strategies you're using, you know, this whole myriad of things you're looking for, actually when you teach with a global focus in your classroom, you're able to address those things much more intentionally and purposefully. So it's not one more thing, but it's the thing that actually gets us to the outcomes we're looking for. So I think really helping leaders understand what that looks like and creating this mental image, this mental picture in their head of what it looks like uh, is a really critical piece. Okay, well, I would just add what Jamie was talking about earlier, which is, you know, it's a mindset. It's like, what problem do you want to solve? And I think that's a question, not just for students, but I think it's for all of us to really think about as we think about the different kinds of um, resources and, and strategies for, for building global education right now. Great, thanks, Claire. And that leads to my next question, is, is how do all of us get involved, or how can school leaders build in um, involvement from the community, from parents, um, and, and to garner support for building global competency into the curriculum and making it a reality for students in the class? Well, I can start uh, Great, real quick. but. I, um, a couple years ago, about four years ago, I had an experience where I was sharing um, a film with Chicago public school teachers. And the film was really based on um, a violence in Ecuador, basically gang violence in Ecuador. So this really hit home with Chicago public school teachers. And um, what was the most valuable thing about that is that afterwards we had a really emotionally charged discussion with the teachers in the room 
Um, and what came out of it was that the teachers had um, an idea that let's bring this film back to our communities, let's share it with the parents, let's share it with the students, let's share it with the organizations, everyone that's involved, and let's try to come up with some solutions. And what also came up is that, yes, this is scary, you know, um, some principals didn't even want to go there, and that's realistic, but I think to have those conversations is a good place to start. I think we, we've also seen some examples, and, and Tony can certainly speak to this, where this type of focus can really be transformative in a community, and the school is a centerpiece of that. And so I'll give a shout out right now to the Aurora Public Schools in Colorado that are just beginning this initiative, working with the Asia Society. And so this is a community that is extremely diverse. Uh, many of the schools have upwards of 40 languages spoken in the, in the building. And so as a community, they're seeing this diversity driving the need for the schools to be responsive. And so in a sense, uh, they're addressing actually a lot of things in the community that for many years maybe had not been spoken to. By So in this partnership, they're really not only helping to celebrate the diversity, but also leverage it to give students opportunities to learn more about themselves as well as cultures that are different than, than themselves. I think we've seen a lot of examples where we can en engage the community in that way. But, but I would say, not to be devil's advocate, but um, and I'm also not going to be political here for a second, but I think we've seen in this political climate right now that there is a strong sentiment in this country that actually going sort of the other direction is where some communities would like us to be, where, where actually diversity is not celebrated, mm -hmm. where learning about different cultures is not uh, something that's seen as a priority. So I just want to put that out there because I think as we think of this country broadly, uh, there are some communities where this is not valued, and so I think somehow we have to break through that to talk about, again, what does success look like for our students in, in, the, in this 21st century, in this global society? You know, from what I recall when the internet came out, there are people who said, oh, this is a fad, that'll go away. You know, how's that going, right? <laughs> and I kind of feel the same way about global. Like, some people are like, oh, well, this is just a fad. Well, the reality is our society is going to be much more global, not less global, as our kids go into it. Mm -hmm. So it, it, whether we like it or not, whether we want our kids to travel, we want our kids to learn different languages, that is the world they're going to live in. And so as schools and as leaders, we have to be able to communicate about that to our constituents. I think it's, un it's sometimes easy to underestimate parents. Um, we, we work with a, a school district in eastern North Carolina that is amongst the lowest wealth districts in the entire country. Um, and, and they were trying to figure out, okay, they were hemorrhaging students. They were losing all their students to private schools and to charter schools. And they were trying to figure out what can we do to attract these students to return uh, to the district. They were about to go basically out of business. And they, they looked at Avenues. And, and everybody here probably knows Avenues, the world school in, in New York, which is incredible. Um, it's, it's what probably every one of us would want our kids to have in terms of an education. And, and they said, you know, that's, that's where we're going. That's what we want to do. And, and this is a place with 90% free and reduced lunch. Um, it had been... Uh, destroyed by a hurricane underwater for uh, for months, um, and and they had to make a comeback. And what they did was went to their community and they and they pitched this concept of globalizing the entire district. To start with a, a a single school that was going to be a flagship school that would be a K-8 uh, model in which they would have dual language, they would have global curriculum, they would have international teachers, they would train all their domestic teachers to to integrate global themes. And, and they, they, they announced this in January of 14, hoping that they could get 300 kids to sign up. And by March, uh, they had 500 kids that signed up. They had 100 more kids on a waiting list. And that program's now a year old. Uh, and they've extended this program to every single school in the district. So it's, it's, a, it's a global district. And recently, I was able to go to a community event to celebrate the progress of this district. They have saved that district. That district is, is global from top to bottom. Uh, students are excited, parents are raving, and they have pulled almost every single kid back from the charter school and about half from the private school. Um, it, it's been transformative. And so I, I think that one of the things we all need to remember is that, um, that, that technology affords us now the opportunity to take the things that we all do well and extend them at scale to all kids. Um, and I think that that's the critical piece now, is how do we move from the lucky few to all students. And you know, that's where we're dedicated uh, to, to, to moving as an organization. And, and I think that as a group, if we can do that, uh, we can make a lot more progress. Okay. And so related to that, um, what are some of the challenges that you face um, 
and kind of pulling off Brandon's point as well, reaching those areas that are harder to reach or those areas that are um, under resources or perhaps any other issues that might come up with equity um, in terms of uh, making an international experience possible for, for students. What, what uh, approaches have you taken um, in, in the past? Um, I think there's a couple of things to think about with regard to equity. Um, I, I think, first of all, we need to sort of take a, a big picture view of this, which is um, when we think about what we want kids to learn in terms of global competencies, that is the 21st century equity issue. Because if kids do or do not have the, the cognitive capacities to be able to you know, be analytical and curious and, and, and have critical thinking skills to get them in the global economy and both for their own you know, uh, ability to make a living, but also to raise up societies and begin to sort of do something about this ridiculous bifurcation of income and wealth, then then they as individuals and society at large is going to go down the tubes. And the same thing happens with regard to sustainability issues. If we don't have kids who are able to actually use their inventive minds and make a difference in the world around sustainability issues, and even more so around things like prevention of um, of, of violence between cultures, uh, and, and, and the sort of racking pain we have in the world now around people at, at, at sort of each other's throats because they don't understand each other. Th these are survival issues for the society and for individuals. And so I just have to sort of say, we have to realize that this is not just a school issue. This is the issue of our times. Yeah. And so we have to sort of regard it that way. Um, and, and, and I'll just say one other word about equity. Um, I've, I've actually thought a lot about kind of, you know, what would happen if we actually achieved equity? Um, you know, and, and so certainly you would have a lot of kids, and I, this is a little bit from a blog post I, I put in today's ed Education Week, but you would certainly have a lot of more kids of color and, and kids from impoverished backgrounds who would be part of the global economy and part of the set of solution makers within the world. But I think I, I was trying to reflect on what it would mean as an individual. What, what does it mean to be globally competent, and what does it mean to be equal in a global context? And to me, there was three things that really stood out um, when I thought about my own experience and however much global competence I've achieved in my own life. Um, and one was um, that you, 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 you developed what actually W.E. Du Bois spoke of 100 years ago, of a dual consciousness. Mm -hmm. And in, in today's world, it's a multiple consciousness. But it's, 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 it's the empathy, it's the understanding, and the ability to see from somebody else's point of view Again, not as a nice thing to be able to do, but because it's, it's a survivor skill. That was what it was for black people in white America for 100 years or thousands of years now or hundreds of years. And I think all of us now have to develop that same capacity to be able to understand each other from a very deep perspective. It also is a, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's sort of turning off the primal urge of classifying somebody different as a threat. And so if you have the capacity to sort of rein in or replace that kind of sense of, of everyone who is not like you and not from your tribe is going to be a threat to you, then that's, that's what it means. That's what equity and equality means in a global context. And I think the last thing I would say is that, it, to me, global competence means global confidence, that you actually feel as though you belong in these conversations, either at the boardroom in New York or you know, in, in, in classrooms around the world, that you, you, you don't feel as though you're not rightfully there, even though this conversation is nowhere where you would imagine yourself being when you were a child. Mm -hmm. So those, those things to me are what it means on a felt experience level to be globally competent and, and globally equal. And I just want to, I just think we should think about that in, in terms of like how we, how we express this need, um, both from a personal and a societal level. So that's what I would say. Yeah, it was fantastic. And by the way, it was a fantastic uh, uh, column today. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think the uh, one of the challenges we have is, is how do you ultimately get at scale? E equity, I think, in, in global is about how do you extend this more broadly to, to all students. And I think there's two opportunities there, and, and both relate to technology. Technology gives you the capacity to scale and deliver uh, training, deliver resources uh, to schools and, and to teachers. Um, but it also allows you to stay um, cost effective, to keep costs low. Um, a lot of the, the challenges we face around global is just pure expense. And so the two things that I think are, are critical is, is integrating uh, using technology and keeping costs down. And then in that sense, we can take global away from being just a magnet school and making it available to all schools. Yeah, I, I, I was exactly where I was going. Unfortunately, in a lot of school systems around this country right now, 
policy and practice are getting in the way of this. And I'll just give you two very quick examples. Uh, in many urban school districts around the country, public school systems, there is this opportunity for school choice, right? That students can actually vie for different schools and where they go. I grew up in a town where there was one high school, that's where you went, come hell or high water, that was your choice. But in a lot of urban communities, students are provided this opportunity to bid or to, to choose, and unfortunately we don't always do a very good job of helping communicate what those choices are, protect, particularly for English language learners mm -hmm. and for families that are new to the community. They're not educated on what those choices are. And so we start to c perpetuate some of the inequities by virtue of some of the schools being magnet schools that have a global focus and other schools where that's not the case. Right? And so it starts to sort of perpetuate this idea that global is just for some kids, not for all. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's one very concrete example of how a policy mm -hmm. within a system perpetuates the gap. Uh, the other is at the school level where actually uh, there's, there are tracks, right? There's a global academy or there's a global course, but you can only take the global course if you get these other four courses done, mm -hmm. right? And so already students who maybe academically are struggling or maybe aren't uh, as far along, that's not a pathway that's an option for them. Right, so I think the structures and systems we put in place at the school and district level have a lot to do with the perpetuation of these inequities. Uh, and I'd also say this is true for teachers, but which we haven't really talked much about, I think the next panel will get into this, is that for, for us to really expect this to happen for students, we need to develop teacher and leaders global competence. Right? And so there's a lot of systems that are not making a commitment to make that part of their not only definition of success, but in terms of providing time for teachers to collaborate, professional development that develops it. And so again, that just further perpetuates this gap. So I think as leaders in this room and those of us who are gonna go beyond and work with leaders, we really have to make this a priority and have people look very closely at the systems and structures they put in place and how are they enabling global education to happen, not limit it. Thank you. Go ahead, Claire. Well, I just want to expand on what Tony said on a, on a personal level, and I can't recall who wrote this, but education is the ability to meet life's situations. And I think that's why Steve asked this question in the very beginning, is being able to share, you know, what, what is your powerful global <coughs> experience? Because we all know what it feels like to to leave the country for the first time and to have that that vulnerability come up and it it really is a life changing experience. So, how can we create that for students who don't have that possibility to leave the country? But with technology today and the resources that are available, there is a way to create that and to bring those universal values into the classroom. Thank you. I'm going to ask one more question and then turn it over to audience questions, um, so get ready. Um, and my last question is actually, Brandon read my mind, um, which it was going to be, I've seen it be very powerful for teachers to have global co connective and collaborative experiences and for school leaders to have those experiences as a driving force for then um, making those experiences open for students. Um, would any of you care to share about an experience that you have in connecting perhaps with other education leaders um, internationally or globally um, and how that's impacted you professionally? I'll just share um, just a quick um, experience. We um, connected with some teachers in Thailand who um, were using a short film of ours and it was the short film was just describing what's happening in Louisiana. So, you know, this small island that's kind of sinking into the sea. And so what they did with their fourth graders um, is they used this film and the fourth graders reflected on it, kind of reenacting um, what's happening on this island. And the end project was the students used Legos to recreate the scenes. So that was a, a creative moment, even though our you know, resources aren't really built for elementary students, but, but the concepts are. And I think at that age, at 10 years old, I think um, it's quite accessible. Thank you. Anyone else care to share? Go ahead. Um, well, so for, we're, we're entering our uh, 30th year in a week. Um, and uh, in that time, we brought 12,000 international exchange teachers to the US from 77 different countries all, all around the country. And, and all of these teachers come in for a period of time, but then ultimately they go back to their home countries. The idea is that they come here, they share 
their culture and language with our students, but ultimately have a very um, um, important uh, U.S. experience and then go back out to their countries and hopefully share that for the rest of their careers. Um, what has happened, and, and with technology, and we had the question about five years ago, what could you do? Uh, what could you not do then you, you can do now? And, and so we've been able to now connect these 12,000 teachers to um, domestic teachers that are we training to, to integrate global content. We can do these classroom to classroom partnerships with teachers who have been here, understand the US education system, but are back home now. And they want to connect their classrooms back to the schools in which they taught uh, or other schools. And so, so this opportunity to create these virtual um, collaborations is, is really growing and real. Thank you. I'll just say a quick word. Actually, about a different program with an agency society called the Global Cities Education Network. And this is a network of school leaders, uh, school district leaders, urban school district leaders in Asia and North America. It's kind of a learning community for those folks to think about what common problems and policy they have at that level. But the one thing I would say that I, I've been amazed from that is how universal this issue of wanting our students to develop these global competencies is. I mean, this, this is not a conversation that's just happening in the United States. In fact, it's happening maybe even more in a robust sense, and mm -hmm. dynamic sense, in other countries. It may be called, you know, different things in different places, but the idea that we have to fundamentally transform our education system, and it's really interesting because you, you go to a place like Hiroshima, where they have this absolutely fantastic sort of diagram of how they're going to change their system. It's going to be globally focused, and they're going to create these things called super global high schools. And you say, well, that's great. How are you going to do that? And say, well, that's the part we haven't quite got to yet. But, <laughs> but we're, going to, we're going to get there. But I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to be derogatory. They, they are, know that they're going to get there. They've got an idea. And so they want to be part of a global conversation to help them get there. And that's actually, if I can put a quick plug in for something we're doing in Asia Society, we're creating something called the Asia Society Center for Global Education because we want to have a global platform for this kind of conversation and constituency building around global education worldwide. And so come September, we're launching that because we have seen this phenomenon worldwide and we want to begin to harness it and develop constituencies of support for this work everywhere. Thank you. And I'll just synthesize what I think all three of them said is that teachers and leaders need networks, right? And so I think Steve and Lucy have done an amazing job through the Global Education Conference of creating this global network over the last half dozen years or so to really have teachers and leaders engage with one another to think about this work. And so I think of networks sort of on three levels, sort of the three R's. One is around relationships, that networks give us relationships with others who think of the work the way we do and to give us the opportunity to collaborate. The second is around resources. You know, we're living in a time of diminishing resources. And so to the extent a network can can contribute to one another and that your ideas feed my ideas, the things you've created are things I can use as a teacher and leader. And then the last one is this idea of resiliency, that like teaching is hard work and increasingly for teachers and leaders, it's getting harder with all the demands. And so how can these networks then provide us the resiliency that we need to do the right things for kids? And so I think the examples that they gave are really powerful around how these networks can help us do that work. And I'll just do one plug too, in addition to the Global Ed Conference, uh, this Fall again in October, we're going to have the second Global Education Forum at the University of Pennsylvania. Many of the organizations here today are in part sponsoring that. Last year we had about 400 educators from around the world representing 26 states and 16 countries. And so this is an opportunity for any of you that would like to engage again in this sort of a format over an extended period of time. The goal there is to really try to elevate the best practices of what's happening around the world and, and, and kind of the premise of learning with and from one another uh, instead of this idea of competition. So uh, information went up today at globaledforum.com. So we hope some of you will join us at that. Great, and thanks for putting the plug in. Um, now I'm gonna hand it over for questions. Start. <laughs> Great. Go ahead, Steve. I, I was really hoping somebody would bring up the uh, dual language immersion school concept. How does that play into this, and what do those do that uh, gives them such strength and power? Um, thanks, Steve. Uh, I, I think um, so. We run a network of sixty schools uh, that are are in in North Carolina that we support uh, in a site based way, and then also work in, in Houston to support their dual language initiative, which is, which is significant. Um, they opened 55 dual language schools in the last two years. Um, the the data is staggering. Uh, I think you've all probably seen it. Uh, the students, uh, they're, they're learning their core content in the target language, um, and it not only means that they're going to build extraordinary proficiency, but we've seen great gains in cognitive development and executive function. Their test scores are up 25 to 30 percent. 
uh, across all, all uh, uh, groups. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's rural, uh, doesn't matter if it's urban, doesn't matter if it's wealthy or low wealth, it, it works in every situation. In addition, there, there are different models. So you have full immersion, which is 90% of your, your, um, your core content would be taught in, in the target language. So typically those would be English speakers that were taking all their core content in either Spanish or Mandarin. And again, extraordinary results. Um, but, but the model that's probably uh, uh, very, very effective and cost effective uh, is, is called 50-50 two-way immersion in which half of the students are typically going to be Spanish speakers, half are going to be English speakers. Um, and you put them into the same environment, you switch the language 50-50, A day, B day, or half day, half day, or subject by subject. And the results are staggering. The kid, the the uh, typically the the, the Spanish-speaking students will have their language and their culture validated. Um, the English speakers will learn about another uh, another culture, another uh, way of life, and and they they support each other in learning each other's language. And it's really an extraordinary thing to see. Um, I think that. Uh, you know, it's kind of exploding right now. I think you all have seen plenty of articles. Um, it's, it's, it's the way we should be learning languages in this country. I mean, many of us took three years of X and can't speak a word. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, it's a $5 billion industry that we continue to, to operate, a, a language industry that, that has about a 99% failure rate in generating proficiency. So um, if you look at uh, what you can do, I think we should start pushing on that. We should start saying that we need to get more return on our investment in traditional world languages and dual language, dual language immersion is clearly one of the, the, the best ways to, to go. I think it also starts with expectations. So in other words, in, in some communities, students who come to school not able to speak English, English language learners are seen as a problem to deal with instead of seeing it as an asset to celebrate. And so if we lead with the idea that students who come to our schools not speaking English have an advantage in the sense that if we can help them develop their English language capacity, they will at least be bilingual, which is further along than I am. I can barely speak English most days, right? <laughs> so, so the reality is, but we don't think of it that way. And as a teacher, if I don't have training or expertise and strategies in helping those students, again, it's seen as a problem to be overcome instead of an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of it is expectations as a school and as a system, that that's something we expect for all of our students, and we will build the structures and supports to do it. Uh, unfortunately, it's many cases when the budget cuts come, it's world languages that are the first thing to be cut. So that, to me, communicates very clearly about whether or not we hold that as an important outcome. I saw a question. Yeah, Hello. Um, I have a question about how you've seen this global learning initiative happen both in schools and continuing into and out of the school, into the home, and so that the person, the learner, takes this into their their life kind of essence, right? So um, what I've seen a lot is things are going on in schools. Parents are putting a lot of responsibility on the schools to teach something, to make it all happen. Have you seen any effective programs that link both the, what's going on in the schools and what's going on in the home, and then opportunities for those students just as part of their weekends, part of their life, to get more of this type of information embedded into their, into their system? Not exactly, <laughs> but <clears throat> no, I, I, I must admit, I, I haven't seen um, the extension to the home per se, but I mean, a, a, a lot of the work we do at Age of Society, or another aspect of the work we do at Age of Society, is to think about the informal learning systems that are out there and how do you actually use those as a means to um, advance global education. And so we've done a lot of work with YMCAs and what, you know, the, the Boys and Girls Clubs and, and particularly state after school networks to really develop a toolkit by which um, they then can, in their normal programming, which is often, you know, has a, has a higher level of flexibility than kind of school-based programming and school-based learning, um, use, t take, take the global uh, an initiative, as it were, in that context. And so we've done a lot of work to really provide that community, those communities with the tools and the understanding and the competencies and the definitions and so forth, that that can be extended in that space. Um, and then there's actually also a number of occasions when um, schools and, inf and, and informal learning uh, organizations in our communities work together. And so you do have that kind of, you know, double whammy, it, you know, a, a couple of hits on, on kids to be able to uh, have this opportunity, not so much necessarily in home, or they may be extending that there, that I just don't know about that part, but um, in their school and after school work as well, 
they're getting a double dose of global, which I think is really important and, and an effective way to, to develop their capacities. Can I, can I add an answer to that? So d does anybody here know Larry Ferlazzo and his program with the Hmong students in Sacramento area? I, I think he's probably doing something you'd be interested in. And if anybody knows more about it than I do, please feel free to connect with Marcy. But uh, bringing computers into the homes, uh, providing the language material, and then discovering that the families are benefiting as a whole from that activity. Very cool. Okay, well, um, our time's about wrapping up, so I wanted to uh, say thank you to our panelists for sharing their wisdom and expertise. Thank you. Thank you. And